I'm Annalise Parks from Lake Forest College. And I was wondering, uh, like we said in the last panel, about categories. And one of the categories that came up in my mind was avoiding westernization. So with the medical studies ones, I was especially, I was wondering how you avoided taking your like western fear, your western like nervousness into it and just being completely consumed and selfless. Um, one thing I realized the first first time I stepped into a healthcare facility in India, the first thing that hit me was, wow, they don't have a lot of resources in a negative way. But after visiting a couple, I realized that they use the resources they do have in almost a better allocation than we do in the U.S. Um, for example, the cataract surgery that I saw at Curie, um, they crank, cranked out like 18 in one day. And a lot of these people can't afford to do them, so they do them for a couple dollars of surgery or free. And they do that by using minimal resources and doing them one after another. So even though they don't have the same resources we do in the U.S., looking at it from a different perspective is what kind of care do they provide with these resources really gave me a mindset with which to look at these things. Um, I had a really hard time being completely selfless. Um, but one thing that I will say is that I really admired um, Alison Burley's salutes. Like every day they went out into the community on vaccination campaigns, every day, from sometimes nine to five. But this, this <laughs> occurred every day. And so I thought that was very admirable of the clinic. Um, so even though they couldn't reach everybody and they didn't have the, the medical supplies for an entire community, they at least reached some people in that community and they spread this awareness so the people that didn't get the drugs um, on the day that we came, at least they know that now this is something that they need to consider and maybe try and go somewhere else to, to get those, those medical supplies. I mean, I didn't study a ton about medical research in Micronesia, but um, we did go to a couple hospitals and the big thing I saw was just the rudimentary, you know, practices they had. I mean, they did have, you know, one an ICU unit, and they were getting some of the U.S., you know, the new Western technologies. But I mean, you know, they had cots, you know, scattered throughout a big room, forty cots in a room. There wasn't much privacy for the patients, and they weren't, you know, if there was any chronic illnesses, like I said, they had to be exported to Guam or the Philippines or, you know, Hawaii or the mainland, which was very, you know. It was uprooting for the citizens there because they didn't really understand in terms of what was really happening with them. So, you know, there's a lot of expats that were there as doctors trying to explain to these people what's going on, getting them the best care that they can. But again, as I said before, there's just not that many resources there to do that. So it's kind of, you know, they're in a tough situation with what to do. Um, as a nursing major, um, I found it really difficult because, at first, because a lot of things that I did see. Um, were practices that I wouldn't have been used to and I wouldn't have been accustomed to and it probably would have been very similar to you being like, oh my gosh, they're not using gloves to like touch everything. Um, but as I spent my time there and worked with people, um, my perception really changed and it was really similar to yours. It was, wow, these people are really trying to do the best they can and it's, it's working to a point. I mean, there's always a way to advance it. But a lot of difficulties that I experienced because I was in rural Tanzania was just the access to it. They don't have roads for the majority of it, and a lot of people are walking a very, very long distance to get to healthcare. And um, the village that I was in, um, I actually noticed that a boy, a two-year-old, was going into probably renal failure while I was there and was having seizures. And just the frustration of not being able to get him to health care that he deserved was pretty difficult. But on the flip side, I did have the opportunity to um, work with a lot of um, uh, people that worked with traditional medicine and used plants. And I think that there are, uh, it's so affordable for them and that there are with, uh, like potential possibilities of uses for traditional medicine that we don't even consider here and we would just shun otherwise. And so um, I think that they're like that kind of opened up that aspect because kind of we're so westernized and we believe that this is the way we should do it and maybe we should be thinking 
out of the box a little more. Um, so I can't speak so much to the medical case studies, um, but at the temple that I stayed at, um, it was interesting because the leader, or the, the Roshi, he, he wouldn't avoid westernization. I mean, he actually used it to kind of promote his own beliefs and his own ideals, but his temple was very much tradition. And even though he uses he used these forces of globalization, you still felt you were in a Japanese tradition at that, which is interesting to me. Um, uh, as uh, Andrew Yarbrough, the lawyer, uh, my question is from Ms. Menjes. Uh, uh, in dealing with FGM and a local uh, society, what obstacles do you face and how to confront that issue with the society and especially with the issues surrounding that? In the United health -wise States? And so forth. In the United States or abroad? Uh, in, oh, in, uh, sorry, in uh, Tanzania. Uh, so it's kind of a broad question. But um, what I dealt with is it's really being eradicated. They really aren't dealing with it as much from where I was in the northern part of Tanzania. It's really looking frowned down upon from a cultural standpoint now. Um, because it does, um, there is a risk for transmitting AIDS with the equipment being used. And so um, it's more of a health, public health risk. And so they are really working from a local level through women's groups predominantly. And starting out um, with the Maasai, a lot of it is you have to work with the men first before you work with the women. So it's a lot of education. I don't know how, what else you want. But yeah, mainly it's the education and working with social justice groups and working from the ground up, really. So, but um, it is really getting more of a negative um, Annie Schneider of Cornell College. My question is for Eric. Um, so when I was in South Africa, they, were, they had just hosted the World Cup, and they were talking about how it had really brought the races together. And I was wondering if you had seen any of that in your study of the Olympic Games, or if it was the opposite, and your thoughts on races and did you say races together? Yeah, no, races. Sorry, I didn't have to be racist. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a celebration of like country unity. And I was wondering if you had seen any of that. Yeah, sure, I'll close to the microphone. A uh, parallel there is uh, Rio's not hosting the 2016 Olympics. I got in front of Chicago, and they're also hosting the World Cup the same year. The World Cup is really advancing in popularity, and the world stage is definitely there. Um, I think. With the Olympics as a stage, as far as the races, more countries coming together, it's been an historical construct more going back to you know, the Maritime Ice with the U.S. versus uh, uh, Russia, the U.S. Sorry, back then. It was, there's a lot more to be said back then. In fact, people's complaints with the modern Olympic Games has been that it's not as much of a cultural celebration, it's much more of a commercial celebration. Uh, we saw that uh, the turning point really being 1984, Los Angeles, you know, imagine LA having Olympics and commercializing it happened, um, but then Atlanta being found in the Coca-Cola games. Um, it, Olympics have really gone from, well, I was in Munich, where it was largely publicly financed, to now the largest source of revenue for the organizing committee is from television sponsorship rights. NBC pays something on the order of $100, $200 million for the package deal to broadcast it. So commercialization is more in, cultural history is out. So what separates the Olympics from being a celebration and not just an amalgamation of world championships. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure where we'll continue to see it go, but uh, I think because of that, the World Cup and other sorts of uh, spotlight events are gaining more prominence in the Olympics are somewhat losing them. Um, I have a question. I thought it was curious that uh, the three of you women were working with the medical field, and um, I wondered if, uh, I, I mean, there were definitely times when you were working with just women, it seemed like. And I was wondering if um, like you observed that more women or more men were like working in the medical field, or if it was an even split. I was just kind of curious. Does that make sense? Is my question make sense? Um, I guess when I was working in the clinics, um, it depended on where I was um, and what the clinic was aimed towards. Um, the public clinics that I went to 
the doctor, it was pretty much a male um, affiliated, like doctors were males, and um, there were a few nurses, but they just, they had very limited resources in the beginning, and they were very small, but pretty much all the doctors were male. Actually, now that I think about it, they probably all were male. Um, and then I worked with like women's groups, which did give, provide the health education and the information, and those were predominantly women. Um, I actually worked with an ophthalmologist that was a female, and um, I tried with an OBGYN that was also female, but was, in India, it's a very demanding field still. Doctors are on call, I think, or the surgeon was on call every other day. So um, a lot of the female physicians and nurses don't really have much balance between their work and family life, but they make that decision. So there are a lot of dedicated women in the medical fields in India right now. So I think I actually had a very opposite experience. Everybody in my clinic was mostly female. So there were two male doctors um, and two male nurses. And the male doctors never went to the um, compos and bodios with us. And they weren't even full-time doctors at the clinic, I don't think. So, um, so mine was predominantly female. Um, since you mentioned there were a lot of temples that fell into disrepair or just kind of become tourist traps, did you have difficulty kind of gaining an entree since you yourself are not a Buddhist monk? Um, well, it's a great question. Um, a lot of the, the monks there, they commit, um, you have to commit for a year, the, the, the first monks, and but many of them have been there for 20 years. Um, so as, as someone is kind of like a, kind of a tourist, so to speak, coming to a, a Buddhist temple, um, I, I don't know, I, I felt like I was going to become enlightened, you know, like I was going to, I was going to, I was going to give it my all, I was going to try my hardest to stay within this kind of a strict lifestyle. So, yeah, in one sense I was definitely a tourist, but in the other sense I was kind of, um, I don't know, I was willing myself to, to become as much a part of the temple as it once I would there. 